This morning on Easter Sunday, we are beginning a brand new sermon series here at Walk Church that we're titling, Believe the Hype. Believe the Hype. I really believe when we think about the person of Jesus, that there's a lot of hype around him. But the question is whether or not we believe it. The word believe is a verb which means to accept something as true, to consider something to be genuine or real, to believe something to be accurate, to believe something and have confidence that it's, it's true. The word hype is a noun. It means something that is extravagant or cool, something that is publicly promoted. It has a buzz around it. It's something that people are talking about and curious about. And so I started to think about what should our theme be for this Easter Sunday, and I felt like God placed the phrase, believe the hype, on my heart. And, and I got so excited about this series that I said, you know what, we can't just do this for one week. This needs to be a, a whole six-week series as we use this phrase to talk about the things of God. So this is just part one. I hope you'd come back next week to experience part two of our Believe the Hype series. Author Ryan Jones wrote a book in the fall of 2003 titled King James, Believe the Hype. Now, he wasn't talking about the King James Bible. Rather, this was referring to the basketball player, LeBron James. Now, this was on the outset of his NBA career. He had just finished high school, was known as the greatest high school basketball player to ever live. And so this guy, Ryan, wrote this book and he called it Believe the Hype. Should we believe the hype about LeBron or not? Will he be the same player and will his game translate to the next level or will it just remain hype? Years later, right, we can attest that it wasn't just hype as he's now recorded several championships and has become the LeBron James that we know him to be. It wasn't just hype about his story. In Michigan, there's a city called Jackson and every year the Jackson public school administration system comes together to develop a phrase that can be a hashtag or a a line that's used to create momentum for the school district. Well, last year in 2018, they used the phrase, believe the hype. And the director of communications said, we say believe the hype because we have something to put behind it. We believe we have the hype every month, the hype every week, the hype every day towards changing the future. This phrase, believe the hype, is a phrase that we use in culture to talk about something that is getting attention. And I believe that that we can take this phrase and we can apply it to Jesus. I want to go ahead and preach a message to you this morning on Easter Sunday that I'm titling, Believe the Hype About the Resurrection. Believe the Hype About the Resurrection. I would argue this morning that over the past 2,000 years, there has been a lot of hype surrounding the person of Jesus, the work on the cross, and the triumphal resurrection. There are still people talking about it today. What happened? Who was there? Was it real? A lot of hype. And I believe today that you can be confident and that you can believe that hype. Over the span of history, there has been several people to talk about this person, Jesus. And I don't want to just quote Christians. I recently read some different statements on the person of Jesus. Mahatma Gandhi, the Indian political figure, once said it like this when he was asked about the person of Christ. He said, Jesus was a man who was completely innocent, offered himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, and became the ransom of the world. It was a perfect act. That's what Gandhi said when he referred to Jesus. I then read about Napoleon Bonaparte, The French general and emperor, when asked about Jesus, he said it like this. He said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself have founded great empires, but upon what did these creations of our genius depend? Upon force. Jesus alone founded his empire on love, and to this very day, millions will die for him. Napoleon, the emperor, says, I don't get that, man. He's, he's different than all of us. How about Albert Einstein, the great scientist and mathematician? When Einstein was asked about the person of Jesus, he replied, I'm a Jew, but I'm enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. 
Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers. However, artful, he further added, no man can read the gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. I then read what the painter Vincent Van Gogh replied when he was asked about Jesus in the 1800s. He said, it is a very good thing that you read the Bible. The Bible is Christ. For the Old Testament leads up to this culminating point, Christ alone. He lived serenely as a greater artist than all other artists, despising marble and clay as well as color, working in living flesh. That is to say, this matchless artist made neither statutes nor pictures nor books. He loudly proclaimed that he made living men immortals. Maybe you would ask today, Pastor Hyden, how did Jesus do that? I believe the answer is found in the empty tomb. That Jesus is able to take sinful men and women like us today, people that are dead in our sin, people that have missed the mark time after time again. But because Jesus rose from the grave, friends, we can too, right? I want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus for a little bit this morning. And I just want to give you three quick points on why you can believe the hype about the resurrection. If you're ready, say ready. ready. If you're hungry to eat from God's word this morning, say, let's eat. eat. Just bump the person next to you and say, let's go. The first reason why I believe you can believe the hype about the resurrection, simply put, is because Jesus said it. Jesus said it. Over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus declared that one day I'm going to rise from the grave. Nobody should have been surprised on the day that Jesus rose because he said he would do it. And what Jesus says, come on, he does. Amen. Right. He is a God who keeps his word. And Jesus in the Gospels said it. What are the Gospels? The Gospels are the four narrative accounts of the person and life, death, and resurrection and ascension of the man God, Jesus Christ, written by Matthew, who was an eyewitness of Jesus, a former tax collector who would become a follower of Jesus, Mark, who was a young man at the time who was follow Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, and then write a gospel account upon Jesus' life, Luke, who was a scholar and a physician. He wrote with beautiful Greek, interpreted into our language. He wasn't a follower of Jesus, Right? But he was a person who was a scholar who wanted to develop the most orderly and right account. He didn't want to just believe the hype. He wanted to write about it himself. So what he did, Luke, was interview all the eyewitnesses with his pen and a pad and said, tell me about Jesus. And so we have Luke's gospel, and then we also have John's gospel. John, who was a follower of Jesus, who was one of Jesus' closest and best friends, writes a gospel as well. Now, now watch this. In all four of the gospels, written by four different authors that, uh, that come from different backgrounds and cultures, all four of them record Jesus at one point saying, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise. One of the reasons why you can be confident about the hype around the resurrection is because Jesus told us he would do it. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, the scripture says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, say this with me, be raised. This was before Jesus went to the cross, right? This was way before that. Jesus said, this is how it's going to go down. Spoiler alert. I just want you to be aware that this is what's going to happen. Well, in Mark chapter 8, a different text tells us this, that Jesus, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days, say it with me, rise again. Jesus says it in Matthew. Jesus says it in Mark. How about the Gospel of Luke? Well, in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, we see this on display. Taking the 12, he said to them, see... We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man, see, this, this phrase right here is a prophetic word that one day the Messiah would come from heaven 
to save his people. You can read the end of the book of Daniel, 500 years before Jesus would come, talked about the Son of Man who would be the saving Messiah. Now Jesus is saying, all that stuff you read is happening in front of you, right? He said, by the prophets will be accomplished, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He'll be mocked, right, and shamefully treated and spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day, say it with me, he will rise, won't he? Won't he do it? But they understood none of these things. So good news. Maybe today you're like, man, I don't understand what he's talking about. You're just like the disciples, all right? You're not far away. They didn't get it either. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. You may not grasp it, but I pray by the time we leave here today that you're able to believe the hype about the resurrection of Jesus. And it wouldn't just be head knowledge, but it would be heart reality beating inside your chest knowing who our Savior and King really is. Jesus said these things would happen. In the Gospel of John, he says it as well. Now, this one I thought was really interesting because the Gospel of John is 21 chapters long. It's a long book. It's a robust gospel. But why would Jesus go ahead and tell us the ending of the story in the second chapter? He really wanted them to know, amen? Jesus wasn't keeping it a secret. One day, he would rise and we would celebrate Easter together. The Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And when therefore he rose, right, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. They believed the word that Jesus had spoken. Jesus saying that he would rise should be enough for us to put our confidence that he'll do it. There's only been one person in the history of the world that's ever declared with authority that they are the truth. Right? Once Jesus was asked about the truth, what is truth? You know what Jesus' answer is? I'm the truth. That truth is not merely a concept of information. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus, right. right? Jesus is, in fact, the personification of the truth. If you, sh you should get a dictionary and look up the word truth, it should just have a big old picture of Jesus on it, right? Because when he spoke, he spoke truth, and he spoke about the resurrection and that it would one day happen, amen? So that's one reason why I think that you should have confidence that he would do it. But let me give you the second reason in case you're not good enough, good with that. The second reason why you should believe the hype about the resurrection is not just because he said it, but because he did it. Amen? I mean, this, is, this may seem elementary, but this is the word I needed today. Is that I don't need a savior to just say he's going to do something. But I need a savior who actually did it for me. Jesus didn't just say, you know, guess what, y'all? One day I'm going to die on the cross. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be terrible. I'll be executed and I'm sinless and innocent, but I don't know if I'm going to get up or not. Like, you've seen those commercials, like, okay is not okay, right? J Jesus, we don't need you to just be an okay Savior. We need you to do it. But praise the Lord. Come on, somebody. He did it. He did what he said he would do. We find this in Matthew's account. All four Gospels, again, record a resurrection story and narrative about the Lord Jesus rising from the grave. Each one is unique and special and tailor-made for that Gospel. But I'm going to start with the first one. Let's just look at Matthew's account of the resurrection. Matthew 28. If you're ready, say ready. ready. Now, after the Sabbath... Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. I love how the women of God rise up first, amen? They said, listen, we're going to beat y'all there. We want to go see Jesus in action. Praise God for the women of God in the house. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Can I just pause right there for a second? Is that not just awesome right there? The thing that I love the most about this text is that the people knew that Jesus said he would one day rise. So the Pharisees, the Romans, the scribes, all the people that were shouting crucify him, in the back of their minds knew Jesus said it. So here's what they did. They said, listen, this is biblical. They said, listen, 
You know that Jesus, right? You know, I don't, I don't know if he'll do it or not. It's just hype. But he said he was going to rise. And so you know what they did? They said, get the biggest, baddest, toughest, heaviest stone and roll that thing in front of the grave. Like, make sure it's the toughest, biggest, because there's no way he's rising up out of that thing. They said, done. We put the biggest stone there. They said, well, that's not enough. We want you to get at least two guards, and we need the baddest, strongest gangster guards to stand in front of the tomb. And if anybody even comes close, they're dead. So do you, do you see it? How about God in his bigness says, I'm going to dispatch one angel, and he's going to go over and change the plan. Right? Here comes the angel of the Lord. He steps down. Behold, there was a great earthquake. That'll scare somebody, right? Now, this angel of the Lord descends from heaven. He comes and he says, watch out, rolls the stone away, and then sits on it. <laughs> Just to show it's not a problem for Jesus, right? And it says about the two big, bad, tough guards. Let's read about their testimony. Descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, right? He even describes his clothing. His clothing was the white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. I don't know what to do, bro. You know, just straight up shook, right? What do you do when God steps on the scene? Your biggest, baddest, toughest, hardest heart, God can break through. Amen. And he wants to. And the best thing that we could do is just give it to him. And to just say, Jesus, you have complete control. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. And maybe that's a word for somebody here. Maybe you just sense some fear in your heart. Maybe you're afraid about something. Let me give you a prophetic word from the Bible. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. Amen? Come on, say that with me. Ready? He is not here. For he is risen. As he said. The angel's like, don't, were y'all listening? Sometimes we need that reminder too, don't we? He said it, and he did it. Come see the place where he lay. I love how the angel's like, y'all want to just come in? Don't worry about the guards. They can't even move. <laughs> like Mary and Mary Magdalene is like, do you see the Roman guards right there? The angel's like, they're done. Not a problem. Come check it out. Come check out the site. Do you see Jesus in there? He's not there. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. When you feel the power of the resurrection, you got to tell somebody about it. Our God lives. Tell him that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. And the women ran off to Galilee. And if you want to read the rest of Matthew 28, I think you'll be encouraged by it. But go ahead and check that out. They, they go, they leave, they tell the disciples, and it says that Jesus appeared to them and said, Greetings. I love our God. Amen. He just greets us in the midst of our confusion, in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our burdens, that our God is near and our God is close. And the resurrection power is alive and intact today. We don't just believe in Jesus because he said it. Come on, we believe in Jesus because he did it. I was recently reading about a story regarding a man by the name of Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel is a writer, journalist, and columnist from Chicago, Illinois. And several years ago, Lee and his wife were atheists when it came to their faith belief. Lee uh, scoffed at the fact that God could be real. The person of Jesus was just a myth and a fable. He didn't want anything to do with the thing at all. Until one day, his wife said, you know what, Lee? I just got this stirring going on in my heart, this wrestling inside. I think I'm going to go to church. Lee laughed at her remark and said, you go ahead and do that foolish church stuff. I'll go ahead and sit back and watch you do that, right? So she began to go to church, and then the following weekend, she was back at church, and the following weekend, she was back at church. And what happened with Lee's wife was it was in this season that she began to realize, you know what? I need Jesus. And Lee's wife said, I believe the hype. He's the real deal, and he rose from the grave, and she brought this back to her husband. And Lee said, you know what? It bothered him so much that his wife put her faith in Jesus that he said, listen, I'll go ahead and prove you wrong, and I'm going to go out on a journey to debunk the Bible, especially the person of Jesus. 
And he said, I'm going to even write a column in the Chicago newspaper telling everybody why this Jesus guy is not the real deal. And so he began to get all his books in order. He got all of his history in order. He began to even go to church with her to get stats and to get data so he can disprove it. He began reading the Bible and taking little notes. He began studying the resurrection of Jesus so he can disprove his life. But it was in all of that that Lee began to sense the Spirit of God tugging at his heart. And one day, Lee, in a church service with his wife, though he was there for ill motives, looked at his wife and said, I need to believe. And it was then that he turned from his own prideful ways and he said, I put my faith in Jesus And you know what? I think he is the real deal. I believe the hype. Well, this guy, Lee Strobel, this scholar and professor, he then began to shift his focus. He had all this information now that proved that he was wrong. And he said, I want to take all this information and put it down in a book to prove that he is right. And so he wrote a book called The Case for Christ. And this little book has went on and done so much and has spoken to the nations, the case for Christ. He went on then to write the case for faith. And he even wrote this little book called the case for Easter. And while studying for this message about believe the hype, I picked one of these up, the case for Easter. And I began to read through it because I'm not the smartest dude. I usually can only read little books. Just saying, can I get an amen from somebody? Somebody gave me a testify right there, right? (laughs) And, And I began to read this little book and it began to help me solidify what I already believe, that we can believe the hype about the resurrection. One of the things that Lee says in this book, he says, the resurrection is the supreme vindication of Jesus's divine identity and his inspired teaching. It's the proof of his triumph over sin and death. It's the foreshadowing of the resurrection of his followers. It's the basis of Christian hope. It's the miracle of all miracles. He goes on in this book to lay out some evidences of why we should believe the hype about the resurrection. He talks from a medical perspective and he says there's medical evidence to believe that Jesus not only died that day on Good Friday, but he also rose from the grave as well. He also debunked the missing body myth. Some people said, you know what, well, maybe someone stole his body away. Well, he says there's many eyewitnesses. Over 500 people Jesus appeared to, including the disciples. And he talks about how Jesus and his evidence in his resurrection there. He goes on to talk uh, 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 even more about Uh, the appearances of Jesus and the specific people that he even appeared to. He appeared to even people that didn't believe in him. And they jotted and made notes of that. And it's a history lesson for us today. And so I thought, you know what, it would be cool. We just got a couple of these books. Maybe today you'd be interested. We got about four or five of them here this morning. If you would just put your hand up right now, we'd just go ahead and walk you one down right now. If anybody wants one of these books, we got a few. We got a few over here. We got actually a whole lot. Um, Our ushers are just going to give you what we got right now. Um, and we'll bless you with these books. Again, it's called The Case for Easter. Go ahead and check it out. Amen? Amen. You know what? I saw, hey, we, if there's two people clapping. Let's clap. <laughs> but I noticed that there's a few people that aren't clapping right now because they had their hands up and they wanted a book. The good news is we bought one of these for everybody here today. Come on, right? So when you leave here today, when you walk out and you turn left, there's going to be a table that has all the books, just go ahead and grab one. It's free. It's our gift to you. We just wanted to bless you. It'll be a good read for you this year, The Case for Easter. And hey, if you want to grab one for your friend and there's an extra one there, grab it for your friend as well. And you'll be inspired to not just uh, know the hype of Jesus, but believe the hype about the resurrection of Christ. Jesus said it, And Jesus did it. But let me give you the last point of the message today. And this is my favorite point. If you're ready, say ready. Ready. Jesus said it. Jesus did it. And we experience it. We experience the resurrection. The thing, listen to me, church. Everybody look at me. The thing that separates Jesus from everybody else. The, The thing that separates Christianity from every other world religion is that Jesus lives in us. Is that the same power that gave Jesus breath in his lungs again, now by those who believe in him will live in you. 
that we don't just believe it in our head, like intellectually, I believe Jesus did rise. No, spiritually, I experienced the resurrection in my own life. Watch this verse in Romans chapter 8. Funny that the Romans would be the one that would put Jesus on the cross and guard his tomb. Well, Paul, the apostle, writes to the Romans in Romans 8. Would y'all read this with me? Ready? One, two, three. Let's read it together. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Hold on. Stop real quick. Poke the person next to you and say, that's you. If you're watching this online, that's you if you'd believe it. The Spirit of God who rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. It amazes me. This is the difference maker, church. This is the game changer. Find another faith that actually says the Spirit of your Savior lives in you. Every other religion, in quote, is a try to work hard, 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 and be a good enough person so that one day God might have pity on you and let you in. That's not Jesus at all. In fact, we don't work to get up to Jesus. Jesus comes down to us right? Lives the life we could never live, born of a virgin, fulfilling the prophecies in Isaiah 7, dying the death that we deserve to die, being buried in the grave as a dead man, and three days living out the prophecies about him from Psalm 16, that he would rise and and defeat death and defeat hell and come back again, and that same power can now live in us. That's the resurrection that, that we believe. He will. I love that. Not he might. Not he could. He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. I love the capital S on that spirit. Whenever you see a capital S in the Bible, it's talking about the spirit of Christ. And that same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave 2,000 years ago is that same spirit that can live in you today. And maybe today you're struggling and you say, you know what, I can't make it, I can't win, I can't get over the hump. I just, I just am living in depression or I'm living in anxiety or I'm living in struggle and I don't think I'll ever get out of it. The only confidence that I can give you is that yes, you can because Jesus rose from the grave. What could be worse than dying? Nothing, right? So, so, If Jesus defeated death, what can't he defeat in your life? That's something that I need to tell myself every day. That same spirit is the spirit I need, and that same spirit lives in us. We don't just believe because Jesus said it, even though that's enough. We don't just believe because Jesus did it, even though that's enough. See, because intellectually, you can walk out of here today and say, you know what, I think he's right. There's there's evidence. You can't go to Israel today. I've been to Israel. I spent eight months living in Israel with my wife, playing professional basketball. We made our way to the old city, Jerusalem, often. And you can go find the empty tomb. It's there. Nothing's in there. You can go find tombs of all other types of people, but Jesus is still empty. The reason why I would encourage you to believe the hype about the resurrection is because you can experience it too. I recently had the joy of sitting down with a couple in our church, uh, Baltazar and Jizzy, uh, and to hear their story, and I love the phrase they use when they describe their testimony of coming to know the Lord Jesus. They use the phrase, come alive. I feel like I've come alive in Christ, and that's accurate to describe the resurrecting power that's found in faith in Christ. I want to bring you guys into their story because it's so powerful. Would you guys watch this video right now? At a young age, started chasing that, that lifestyle, that quick money, that secretive mm-hmm. lifestyle. Um, and I really didn't do anything positive for myself, for my family. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't seek a way out of it. I just kept going and going, you know, led, led me to search for, for God more. Uh, but through all that, I met my wife. I rebelled a lot because of the fact that my mom wasn't there with me. My dad, he was very angry. So I was very lost for a while, a long time, even up until recently. One of our mutual friends' wedding came up, but we come to this wedding and we see our friends, Christina and Danny, and they just approach us with like open arms. And Christina, she notices something in me that, you know, I'm down and out and she talks to me. You know, I I shed some tears with her and I express, you know, my feelings and she and Danny invite us to go to church. When we got the invitation, I think we were uh, we were having two separate conversations. 
I'm just in Christina. We're on one side of the of the party. Me and Danny were on another side with another friend. And you know, the conversation just started to spark up. And when we regrouped with the, with our wives, uh, we come to find out we're having the same conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, Christina had just invited Z. Danny had just invited me. But uh, mm-hmm. and we were like, really? Yeah, we're going. <laughs> you know, the, the, the invitation from 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 Christina <laughs> and, and coming her way is just like, hey guys, come you know, come come to walk. We attended that Sunday, and that was like the first day of the best day of our lives. Like everyone at Walk Church, from the greeters to Pastor H to Nina, like every everyone, it was just smiles, and like I still replay that in my head. And like I said, it's one of the best the best days because it was welcoming. You can feel God's presence, and I did not know what that felt like. Um, I left there, um, I think the first three services um, on our way back home, I left there in tears. It was everything to us, the word, God was speaking to us in just incredible ways. And since that day, like we've made Walk Church our family. Going, attending, we wanted to get deeper in the word. So we actually started finding sermons on the Walk app. Even to this day, we still, when we want to get deeper in it, we put on a sermon from the app and we just play it in the car. The kids enjoy it. And man, it's just so amazing. He's changed everything for me. And being baptized has opened so many beautiful, blessed doors for not just myself, my husband, my kids, even extended family. So it's just amazing and I'm so thankful. So now we're, we're, uh, we're excited for this new chapter in our life, you know, moving forward, being able to, to serve in the setup and tear down a uh, team, being involved with the men's group and, and, you know, getting the Mondays with my bros and getting some time needed uh, to, to dig deeper in God's word. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a family, we, we've been able to, to show up to some events and serve. My wife, Jizzy, being involved with uh, the youth, my daughter getting involved as well, mm-hmm. and uh, being able to, to serve for a purpose through our new walk with Jesus. There's a picture I have saved on my phone of me smiling. I haven't smiled in many years. Um, and just looking at that picture, I can, I can read the phrase, you know, I'm, I'm coming alive. Powerful, powerful testimony of the work of Christ in us, where we get to experience the resurrection. Baltazar and Jizzy, thank you so much for being transparent. Everybody looking at y'all now. Come on. Thank you for being a part of this family and a part of this house. We're honored to share your story. Maybe today, before we close this message, you would ask this question. In humility, maybe you would say, So what do I need to do? How can I experience the resurrection in my life personally? Maybe that's where you're at today. I want to give you just a quick next step found in Romans chapter 10. We'll pull it up here on the screen. And this is your next step if this is where you're at today. All right. Here's what Paul writes to the Romans, inspired by the Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the grave. He says, if, if this is where you're at, family, if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord. See, the reality is Jesus is already Lord. He's the Lord of all. But is he your Lord is the question. Have you made a decision where you said, you know what, I'm going to stop trying so hard and I'm going to start denying myself and trusting in, in my Lord, Jesus Christ. When you get to that place where you say, you know what, he's not just the Lord, but he's my Lord. That's the place of power. He says, can you confess that Jesus is Lord and then believe in your heart? Notice it doesn't say in your mind. That you moved from the mind and now your heart, which pumps the emotion and affection and life is found in the, the heart, the nucleus. Can you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? If you can say that today, you say, yeah. I believe Jesus did die on the cross for my sin. He did rise from the grave, and I can be a new creation and experience the resurrection. He says this, you will be saved. You will be saved. 
want to give you an opportunity to respond now to the hype about the resurrection together. Let's pray.